Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Steve Bradley, and we're continuing our journey through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're now on the section of the Gospel of Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll be considering Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 30 at this time. And I've called this the light and the law because you folks, if you're a Christian, are both salt and light. And God has ordained the law, not necessarily for you to obey, but you are to use it to know who you are. So let's talk about this and let's do a little study. Here is the text. You are the salt of the earth, said Jesus to his disciples. But if the salt loses its flavor, its savor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then he says, Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come, he says, to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, and many new versions eliminate that without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, which is a, an expression of disdain, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And that word is literally Gehenna, the uh, New Testament word for the place of torment. Therefore, he says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. For it is far more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So what is a disciple to do? Because the first thing talks about being salt and light but the preceding paragraph discusses this issue of persecution. Blessed are you, said Jesus, when men revile you and persecute you, for so they did to the prophets before you. So in light of the potential effects of your lifestyle on you, if you act as a true Christian, what are you to do? And the first admonition that Jesus gives us is stay salty. Don't give up your true nature. Shine on. Keep the light going. Never give up. Despite persecution, despite anger at your faith, despite ridicule. Now, folks, 
persecution is sometimes a reality and Jesus offers only one word of counsel. Endure to the end and you will be saved. Expect the strength of God and toughen up and shine on. Jesus said you are the salt of the earth, so be that. He said again you are the light of the world, so light up the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus does not say, and this is extremely important, you can be salt. Just be what you are. He does not say you can be the light. You are the light. When Jesus was in the world, he was the light of the world. Now you are because he shines through you. Let your best self shine through. Let your best self salt the world with goodness and truth. For your heavenly Father, do this. Now then we want to talk about the law and Jesus because it's very important. I just read you the passage. But first I want to discuss briefly how the Sermon on the Mount is built. It is time to consider what Jesus does in structuring this sermon. Many have described it as like a string of pearls rather than a logical discourse, meaning he goes from topic to topic without, announce, without announcing or necessarily having any interrelation between his topics. That is a fairly good description. Now, obviously, Jesus does have a sermon plan, but the plan, as I said a moment ago, is topics. Much as any minister will consider different topics in one sermon, or an even better illustration is the news, will consider a number of different stories in one newscast. They don't all have to be logically related, but they're things that happened. In other words, Jesus is dealing with religious issues contemporary to his day, but also universal in meaning and application, and he's dealing with them one by one. For example, Jesus discusses the scribes and Pharisees of his day. Those really don't exist today, but those kinds of people and the way they behave do exist today, and they will exist in the future. Now we approach Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 30. The law, the prophets, Pharisees, and the disciples. And the next item on Jesus' agenda is the law, meaning, as in the next slide, the Old Testament, specifically the moral law. He explains the law differently than the scribes and Pharisees because the law actually speaks not only to what we do, but to what we think, what we desire, how we react, what is in our hearts. In other words, Jesus goes to where the law touches our inmost beings and what motivates us. Now there's an important difference here. The Pharisees and the scribes were concerned only with if I did this, could I be convicted in a court of law? And the court of law cannot convict you for thinking. You can make threats and that is sometimes an item for conviction. But if you don't say anything, if you don't act it out in any way, you can't be convicted. And if you want to understand what the Pharisees and Sadducees, I'm sorry, Pharisees and scribes were getting at, look at the sermon on Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, which discusses why their righteousness would not get them into the kingdom of God. And that sermon is titled, How Can I Know I Am a Christian? Now, the, the law is actually concerned with what God sees. For God looks on the heart while man looks on the outward appearance. And the real issue is what's inside you? Who are you really? God knows. And he is going to be the judge. So the question is, which law? U.S. Constitution, British common law, um, some other law? No, the Old Testament moral law. And here he reveals himself 
as a reformer, not an innovator. He's not giving a new law. It's not as if he's, he's taking and he's erasing all the Ten Commandments. He's saying, follow those, but listen to me carefully. Well, why is that? Well, in the first place, he gave the Old Testament law. Here is how we know. And this chain of reasoning is a bit convoluted, so please follow along carefully. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God appears in a bush, a burning bush, and he appears to Moses by his name, I am. And so in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, we read, then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What should I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now we have this translated in our New Testaments for the most part is capital L, small cap O, small cap R, small cap D, Lord. The Jews would not and won't pronounce the name. And instead, they pronounce it, despite the fact that it's probably properly pronounced somewhere close to Yahweh, they say it as Adonai, or Lord. Now, some have rendered it in English as Jehovah, the old American Standard Bible did that. Others have pronounced the term Yahweh, but most of the time, English Bibles follow the Jewish custom and leave it unpronounced, replacing it with Lord. And that is actually, that is Yahweh, is actually I am. So the I am and the law. So Moses said, who are you? The Lord replied, I am that I am. Tell the children of Israel that I am has sent you. And in Exodus 31, 8, when he, that is the Lord, the I am, had made an end of speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tables of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And those were the Ten Commandments. The I am spoke the original law. And he wrote the Ten Commandments on the two tables of stone with his, very, with his fingers. That I am, folks, is Jesus the Messiah before his incarnation, who was known as the Word and after his incarnation known as Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus says this himself in John 8, 58. He is talking to the Pharisees who are denying his his power and authority. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And that word that's used for was is the Greek word agenito, which means came into existence. I am. In other words, he's always been. And in other words, he identifies himself as the same I am who appeared to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, the I am who put forth his hand and with his finger wrote the law on tablets of stone. The Jews understood this. They really did. They understood what he was saying and they picked up stones to stone him because according to them, he was blaspheming. Now this leads us to the ultimate question of the New Testament. Who is Jesus? It's the most important topic of the New Testament. And Jesus himself assumes the right to authoritatively state the principles of the law. That tells us who he is. It says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he taught them as, uh, as one having authority and not as the scribes. And everywhere the Bible discusses this, and with every biblical author who considers it, the answer is exactly the same. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us in human flesh. God became man, yet he is still God. One of my seminary teachers many years ago put it this way, says, God and man united one person forever. 
and this is why the early Christians confessed Jesus as Lord. They understood this, and this is what he taught. The Jews who opposed Jesus got this as well, for on several occasions they attempted to stone him, and at his fake trial, this was the accusation they made. He made himself out to be the Son of God, which, as we'll see in a moment, means God. In John chapter 10, verse 33, they accused him this way, you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. This was abhorrent to them. And in John chapter 5, verse 18, it says, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, this was a giant special thing to them, but also said that God was his father. Now listen to the next clause, making himself equal with God. And I spent a fair amount of time with this in the original language. And the word used for equal is isos. It is a word that you use when two things are mathematically equivalent. And Jesus did not ever deny this. He always affirmed it. And to the Jewish way of thinking, a man's son had his nature. So in John, Jesus claimed to be equal with God when he called God his father. He proved it by his works. And he said, if I had not done among them the works which no other man did, they wouldn't have any guilt. But now their guilt remains. His ministry was filled with proof. And that's why the scribes and Pharisees hated him so much and why they ultimately murdered him and conspiring to use a Roman cross, a Roman governor, and the Roman government to do so. So what about the New Testament then versus the Old Testament and the law? Well, the New Testament is the book of God's grace. It reveals God's forgiveness and mercy in ways that the Old Testament does not. Chapter, uh, John tells us, that is the Apostle John, tells us in John 1.14, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Why that statement, if the law is approved by Jesus, and if he tells us, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets? Well, there's actually an answer to that. It is because Moses' law was not designed to provide grace and salvation. It was designed as a guide to tell us the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, and what is wrong inside of us. And Paul puts that this way. In first chapter, uh, sorry, first Timothy verses chapter one, verses nine through 11. The law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. In other words, the law is meant to reveal what is really inside you and me and stand a plumb line against our lives so we will know not only what we have done wrong, but the evil in our own hearts. To put it in shortened terms, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We might see it this way. Revealing human sin came through Moses, that's the law. Healing human sin came through Jesus Christ. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to heal the broken, the ruined, the destroyed human race, one of us at a time, and transform both you and me, and eventually the entire universe, into a place of holy beauty and righteousness so that you and I, we can live forever with the Holy God. This is God's end game. And folks, it will happen. 
Now I have intentionally eliminated Matthew chapter 5 verse 20 so you can see the sermon that I mentioned here. Now there is a general message in this section of the sermon. The thought forward slash intent is the parent of the deed. Before you do something, you think of it, even if for just a moment, then you decide to do it. You may stop short of actually doing it, but when you have the thought, the child is conceived. Here is how James chapter one describes this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. That's a, that's a strong feeling some of us have. Well, why did God let me do that? God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, other versions have lusts, by his own lusts and enticed. He's tricked, he's pulled away. He may know what he's doing, but he goes away like, so, like an ox to the slaughter. Then when desire has get, conceived, it gives birth to sin. So first is the desire, and then is the sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now here are some specifics that talk about this. The first thing Jesus deals with is an issue common to all of us, anger, which is the root cause of murder. And <clears throat> I read this before, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And then he goes on and makes more statements about this specific thing. Folks, anger is at the root of all the things Jesus discusses here. First there's anger, then there's hatred, then offense, finally court battles. And in each case, Jesus says to you and me, you be the cure, you be the healer. Don't be full of anger and hate. Forget that, that's not you. As a believer, be the better person. The next one is one with which many people really wrestle adultery and lust. The Old Testament for bad adultery, which is sex with someone not your partner, not your, not your spouse, when married. So if you have sex with a married woman, it's adultery. If you are married and you have sex with an unmarried woman, it's an adultery. And of course, I'm speaking as a guy now. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her, has committed adultery within his heart, with her and his heart. Now I want to kind of identify what Jesus really means here because there are a bunch of things he doesn't mean. In the first place, he doesn't mean normal physical response. There are stimuli. Pretty girl walks past, you notice her. Handsome guy walks past, you notice him. Humans are programmed to react to those stimuli. One of those stimuli is sex, it's hunger is another. Breathing is another. Drinking like water is another. These stimuli are a basic reality of human life. And interestingly, sex is one of the main commands in the early chapter, chapters of Genesis. Genesis 1.28 says, then God blessed them and God said to them, that is Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Well, how do you think that's gonna happen? Fill the earth. And how would that happen? And subdue it. We might say God, sex is God's first command. It's this is very important because a lot of people identify just normal human desire as evil. That is not true. What Jesus means though, is I choose to have that person against the will of God. In other words, 
She walks past, he walks past, you say, I want that person. If all things were equal, I would take that person if there were no consequences. He or she belongs to someone else, but so what? When you would do it if you could, without any consequences, that's when it becomes evil. And this brings up the thing that Jesus says about what to do about mind sins. Mind sins are the ones that you want to do, but you don't. You would do them if you could get away with them. The intent is there. Jesus calls his disciples to deal with these in a determined fashion and fight against them whenever we have them. And the reason is, of course, that God knows everything we think. He knows everything that we do, but he also knows what we think. So the Lord says this, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Gehenna, that is, the place of torment, not just the grave. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. As James told us in James chapter 1, and we read it a moment ago, sin grows, we get destroyed. Sin never stops where you think it will. And that's why James then says, sin, what is, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, this sermon was not specifically about that one thing, so I'm going to stop there. But it's so important to deal sternly with yourself when it comes to sins of the mind, whether it's covetousness, ambition, anger, other kinds of ugliness, witchcraft. People are tempted to do that and so on. Listen, folks, deal seriously with sin. There are lots of other things that we might discuss, but Jesus does not discuss much more about the thoughts and intents of the heart right here. But it is one of the most important teachings of Scripture. The Bible teaches that the reason God condemned the earth to be destroyed with the flood is that violence filled the earth. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the book reads, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And he also saw this. He saw not only the things they were doing, but what they thought, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart, mankind's heart, was only evil continually. And all this evil in the heart became violent, murderous action. This cost the entire population of the earth of those days their lives. Refusing to deal with sin is not a small thing. Now we'll consider more of Matthew chapter 5 in our next episode. And until then, I know this has been some tough words, but I hope God blesses you and fills your life with joy. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, signing off until next time. God bless you all.